This lesson focuses on the Mexican-American generation. So we talked about uh, both the immigrant generation and then that transitional period in the 1920s. Uh, this is the period that many Chicano historians have defined as Mexican-American. And there's a few reasons why, okay? And that's what I'm going to try to articulate in this presentation. So does immigration stop during this period? Of course not, right? Immigration uh, from Mexico continues every decade, right? It just doesn't just one day just stop and you have this new group of people. But there are certain elements that we see in the Mexican-American community that begin to change. So we talked about the Mexican dream. That begins to disappear by this period, right? We talked about, you know, kind of celebrating those Amer uh, Mexican traditions. That begins to disappear to some extent. In the 19 uh, between 1930 and 1960 so in this lecture we'll describe this generation and how they differ from the previous generation and as i said in the last one is that again those of us that have immigrant parents we can distinguish one generation i.e our parents from say our generation so i am very different from my parents um in many ways um you know everything from the way i think to the way i dress to the way i talk um to my ideology right so um this is what we see happening at, at this particular time and there's reasons why so part of it's internal where they feel you know this is the way i identify and other times it's just the politics of the time period that kind of shape um how they look at the world okay so we're going to look at um mexican this generation we're going to look at uh, issues of labor race and gender um, and really kind of focus on this issue, the class struggle, because as the previous generation just wanted to work and make money and go back, this generation that was born here, they got no Mexico to go back to, right? If, if those of you that were born here and have family in Mexico and that don't go there that often, don't really know Mexico, um, <clears throat> besides knowing they have family there, you know, can you just pick up and go back to Mexico? It's like, oh, well, what am I doing here, right? It's not, it's not your home. Your home is here. And that's what this generation is kind of going through that they they are american um but at the same time you know american society doesn't quite fully accept them as full citizens so when we think of citizenship um you know we have a legal definition of such a concept but then we see the way chicanos identify themselves when it comes to citizenship these are very kind of academic concepts so i mean don't go around asking people are you a legal citizen or a cultural citizen um, because it would make no sense to them. But this is more academic where um, sociologists and historians have looked back to try to understand these, this generation through this, these two different lenses. So typically when we think of legal citizenship, we think of you know, people that belong to a community that are based on a, a certain value system, certain meanings that we all kind of share, certain practices that we all share and are tied to a nation state. So what does that mean? Basically, what this means is that, you know, you're born in this country and you act American, right? You share that, those, um, those, that culture of what it means to be American. What that is, um, let's see, any, any given time, you know, what does it mean to be American? You know, we, we listen to American music, right? We speak English. Um, we eat sandwiches, right? Um, we dress in this particular style, whatever kind of might be fashionable at that time, but right, it's a very kind of American uh, fashion that we have in the 1920s, right? It would have been that flapper style, whereas Mexican um, people would have probably not used that clothing style, right? And again, you were born here. <clears throat> now, cultural citizenship, um, kind of challenges that idea. And this is where I ended the last lecture where I made the point of, you know, Mexican Americans are cro crossing a lot of boundaries, both physical and symbolic ones. So it's not just being able to acculturate into the environment, right? Knowing about flapper culture, knowing, you know, a little bit of English, but it's able to use that, that gain um, capital, right? That, that cultural capital and being able to maneuver through these different spaces, right? Again, showing that concept of agency. And that's what these Chicanos are doing. They're not doing it purposely. It's not like they know these philosophies and saying, okay, I'm going to do this. They're just living their life, right? But in doing so, they challenge 
certain perceptions that we have of Mexican Americans, right? That they're not just victims to what's happening to them, but they're active agents. And um, some of them might be U.S. citizens, some of them might not. And I'm going to show you an example of one because sometimes there's unfortunately consequences when when you're not a U.S. citizen um, during the politics of this period. So let's get started. So keep these things in mind. So a lot of times we have our own identity, right? And, and we can have this debate as to how you identify. Hey, are you Mexican American or maybe you think you're Chicano or Latino or Latinx or whatever it may be, right? And that's great. However, um, this is something I do with my other class, um, my Chicano Studies classes. There's the way that you identify, but there's also the way that society identifies you. And sometimes that one's more powerful because depending on who has power, they're the ones who are able to um, kind of define you, unfortunately, right? So yeah, you could call yourself um, Chicano or, or Mexican American, but at the end of the day, if society um, defines you in a particular way, it's gonna have an impact on you. And I'm gonna show you what happens to, yeah, maybe some of these people define themselves as Mexican Americans, but when the Great Depression hits, all that went out the window and you were no better than any other Mexican that was, you know, uh, out in the streets of Los Angeles. So yeah, call yourself what you want. We're going to call you this and we're going to deport you. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, if, you know, when it comes to identity, it's not, it's not a one way street, right? Sometimes it's, it's the other side that, that has a, a bigger impact on people's lives. So there's this debate in the 1920s and, and 30s as to, you know, should we assimilate or should we acculturate? When you assimilate, it means that you basically just let go of your culture, kind of like what the, um, the Houchin House and Whole House and, and those progressives are trying to do, right? Stop being Mexican, in other words, and, and don't, don't, don't be any part of that. And uh, take up this new American identity, and, and you'll be successful. That's at least that's the argument that they gave was wasn't true, but that's what they believe. Or are you going to a culture where you take uh, again ideas of both cultures and you blend it into something new? This concept of mestizaje, right? Creating something new from these two opposite um, value systems these two uh, obviously two different cultures so this is what we see happening going through this generation they're, they're negotiating constantly um, through their experiences here you have a, a bunch of mexican young women um, learning how to sew and basically they're teaching them how to be good mexican workers right so in the 1920s mexican americans are seen as actually as white depending on situations of um, we still face a lot of racism Right, um, but according to the census, we were actually white, and we we're also viewed as kind of cheap labor during this period. So don't don't get too excited, even though this is white. You know, we're we're still not in the promised land, right? But then in the nineteen thirties, our identity again. This is the way society defines us. We were seen as dirty, as lazy, as immigrants, as using up American resources, and we were seen as non-white. All right, so we went from being white to being non-white. What the heck, right? And then nineteen forties. We actually went back to being white, right? We were, uh, but in the 1940s, it's a little bit more complicated because again, it depends on the political climate. We're, we're seen as un-American, still as cheap labor, and we're part of this, you know, you're kind of white, but not full on white because you're part of this hyphenated generation. And again, other, other communities were going through the same thing, such as the Italians and so forth. So this is the way how society kind of viewed us, unfortunately, and, and we're kind of grappling with these this identity crisis that that we have throughout these three decades so let's look at this generation where are they about the mexican-american generation well it's kind of interesting because it's defined by the great depression the great depression is a great almost defining line between the immigrant generation and the mexican-american generation and what happens here is that because of the Great Depression, basically the economy collapses. Those of you that might not know this, in the 1930s or 1929, there's an economic collapse, right? That lasts for about a decade. And um, there's large unemployment. So all these kind of cheap, uh, what, was, what were considered dirty jobs that Americans did not want to do, particularly white Americans, all of a sudden, because there's no jobs left, Everybody wants to do these jobs, right? Everybody go, wants to go work out in the fields and so forth. 
And you have all the Okies and Arkies who are migrating west to places like California to try to replace this labor. And this has an impact because uh, dominant society begins to look at all Mexicans as immigrants, even though you have a large number of them who are U.S. born. I think the majority of them are U.S. born. So what the U.S. government does is that they begin to repatriate people back to their home country, both in the East Coast and in the Southwest. So Mexicans are sent back to Mexico. And these people are known as Los Repatriados. And you see them here uh, in Union Station, Los Angeles. They would just kind of gather you up, round you up, basically. And they would send you back to... Um, Mexico. If you've ever seen the movie Mi Familia, there's a scene in there with Jennifer Lopez that kind of explains this, this experience of them being sent back. And for many of them, you know, they've been here. It's 1930. They were here since, you know, maybe 1910. They've been here 20 years, you know. Most of you have only been born or alive for about 20 years. And that's a long time, right? All you know is America. Many of them were born here. And it is noted that about 500,000 Mexican and Mexican Americans were deported back to Mexico. Um, and about three quarters of those were US citizens, which were mostly the kids of these people who had every legal right to be in this country. So Mexican Americans, um, as I said, they were being rounded up. And if you're walking the streets of Los Angeles at this time, it's, it's quite scary because they can just come up to you. There's no due process. You know, they just come up to you, put you on a train, and send you back to Mexico. There's a story where um, this one woman, she um, gets rounded up, and they ask her, where are you from? And she says, San Francisco de blah, 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 blah. And they put on a train up to San Francisco, California. And she's like, what, what am I doing up here? Right. <laughs> so they gave her a free tri trip to uh, San Francisco. Um, and sometimes you just have to laugh if you go through these experiences, right? But um, this is... This is what kind of shapes this generation where they have to be careful. They don't want to talk English. They don't want to look too Mexican, right? Because unfortunately, they can't do much about their skin, even though they're trying to bleach it at times. But they really try to distinguish themselves from their parents. They try to showcase to American society saying, look, I am not a Mexican. I am not an immigrant. I am a U.S. citizen, just like you. And, and this kind of really begins to shape the politics of this generation. So this generation is U.S. born um, and it's really this kind of bourgeois middle class um, community of Mexican Americans that define the politics of this generation. And one of the best examples that we have is the organization called LULAC. So if you remember from the previous lecture, you have those organization, organizations such as the Mutual Aid Societies that are very proud to be Mexicanos, right? The Hijos de Mexico and Confederación de Mexico and whatever. Um, but they have the word Mexico in their name. If you look at the name of this organization, League of United Latin American Citizens, you don't even know that these people are Mexicans. You almost think that it might be a coalition of maybe Cubans and Puerto Ricans and, you know, uh, Guatemalans and, and, and Mexicans, right? And it, a lot of it has to do with the politics is that there is a sense of shame to call yourself Mexica, a Mexican, so they don't even use the word in their name. And um, the organization is actually still around. It's, it's a very important organization when it comes to Mexican politics, Mexican-American politics, sorry. I, I typically show you a video um, telling a little bit about the history of it. But they're there. Um, they, they really kind of promote this idea of loving America. Here you see some pictures of the members of LULAC. Um, but they have a very kind of, uh, at least for Mexican poli Mexican American politics, they have a very kind of conservative perspective. And but they do do a lot of good. One of the, excuse me, one of the kind of interesting cases that they're involved in, um, even though I'm talking about the 1930s, but 1940s, they're involved in this very famous case called the Westminster case, where they try to segregate Mexican Americans in the. Um, Kind of like in the Orange County, LA area, in, in, in the schools. And they, um, the, the family, it's, it's a few families, actually file a lawsuit against the school saying you cannot segregate Mexican Americans. 
and it's organizations such as LULAC that gets involved. And it's one of the first cases to desegregate um, a school, predating Brown versus Board of Education. There's another one called the Lemon Grove incident in, um, in uh, San Diego, where they do essentially the same thing. They desegregate a school in San Diego in the 1930s. So um, even though it might be a little bit conservative in, in, in terms of, of Mexican-American politics, it's still very, um, you know, doing a lot of good for the community. However, their politics very much so revolve around this idea called ideology of accommodation. They don't want to rock the boat. They're not protesting. Today we had the Black Lives Matter, right, out there protesting, um, being very vocal, being, being very present. This organization, because it is the 1930s, it is the Great Depression, they got to deal with a lot of racism. It's established in Texas, which, you know, has its own kind of history against people of color. Um, <clears throat> this organization says, we're going to fight back but we're going to fight back through the system, right? We're going to use the system to our advantage. So they, a lot of it's using the courts, using lawyers, um, using the law, right? Uh, the Constitution to support their, their causes. So that's more, like I said a minute ago, right? More of a conservative perspective of, of Mexican-American politics. But then you have a little bit more radical that, that's, that's based on class perspective. And it's in the same time period. So it does show you that Mexican American politics is not, it's not all the same, right? It's not uniform. We we have different spectrums when it comes to our politics. Um, there's a somewhat maybe of a middle ground here and there where sometimes that there's coalitions, but it's quite a quite a wide spectrum. And one of them is this woman named Anatena Yuka. She's from Texas, and she. Uh, grows up in the fields. Her mom's a field worker um, in the pecan industry. And she, from a very young age, I think at the age of 16, she's already involved in some of these um, um, movements that are taking place. So before I get into her story, I want to talk about the Wagner Act, because this is important not only here, but also to later periods in the Chicano movement. Now, during the Great Depression, uh, the, the federal government passes a lot of laws. One of them is the Wagner Act. Now, the Wagner Act gave workers the right to organize into a union. This is important um, because later on it begins to, you know, so it, it kind of involves people like Cesar Chavez and all that. So the Wagner Act gave workers the right to be part of a union. So they, and, and if you know anything about unions, unions basically created the middle class. You know, they fight for workers' rights better working conditions, safe, safe conditions, you know, wages, um, health care, things like that, right? Um, making sure that they don't get abused. And um, unfortunately, certain industries were neglected, were not protected under the Wagner Act, one of them being the, um, you know, the, the fields, you know, agricultural labor and domestic labor, so housekeepers, which, you know, tend to be dominated by Mexican people, right? Mexican American people at this time. So even though the, the Wagner Act did a lot of good for certain industries like the auto industries and so forth, it, it didn't really help uh, you know, a certain part of the population. Now, Emma Tenayuca, um, she's out in the fields, right? So they're not protected by the Wagner Act. However, um, you do have a lot of radicalism happening at this time. It's quite exciting time to be alive because a lot of people are part of the Communist Party and these kind of socialist parties and, and these kind of progressive parties that are advocating for real change in the midst of a Great Depression. And we find that her involvement is out in the fields organizing workers. So today, communism has a bad word. Back then, it didn't, right? Because they were advocating for everybody to have a livable wage and have health care and have, you know, be respected at work at the very minimum, you know, that your, your labor does have value. And that you do matter as a human being. You're not just some machine that works and when you break down, they get rid of you. So she organizes workers in the pecan industry, again, at the age of like 16, somewhere in her teens. And um, trying to get better working conditions, better wages for her workers. And she's actually successful in the midst of a Great Depression where people are easily replaced because there's such a surplus of labor. She actually wins um, some concession, concessions 
for um, the the the, um, the the workers. So uh, she becomes a very important um, Mexican American activist, um, and she not only participates in these strikes, but also um, becomes a bit of an intellectual. She writes an essay called "The Mexican Question in the Southwest," which basically addresses how can Mexican Americans get more involved in some of these working class movements. So at the beginning of this lecture, I mentioned that uh, much of the activism is based on economic class. And the belief is if workers, particularly Mexican American workers can get a good wage, then that is uh, kind of like a, a opening towards civil rights. So unlike the 1960s that focuses uh, again on voting rights and things like that, in the 1930s to about 1960s, the focus more, is more on economic class. Economic power gives you access to political power, right? So keep that in mind, all right? That's actually quite key. You have other activists too that kind of resemble Emma Tenayuca in, in regards to their politics. One of them is this man right here. His name is Bert Corona, B-E-R-T, and Corona, like the beer, right? Um, and he's actually from uh, Texas. And um, he's, I think he was the first Mexican American to play college basketball at USC. So uh, believe it or not, you know, we played basketball back then too. He actually gets a scholarship to USC. And back then uh, a scholarship meant that he got a job and um, they gave him a job um, to pay for, for school and things like that. Uh, so he's from Texas. He goes to USC, to California, and he works down by Placita Olvera, the Brunswick company. And... Um, he his focus there is really based on organizing workers like in Matenayuca. But unlike the field, the focus is in the um, in the industrial city, right? In, in, in downtown LA at this for this example. So kind of like in Matenayuca, this notion of class struggle becomes more important than civil rights. You know, pay people a livable salary, give them a good job, good wages that move them up in society, and then political um, rep representation will come because, again, money buys you power. So he actually ends up getting hurt and he drops out of college because um, he can't play basketball anymore. Um, but he gets involved in a lot of, um, a lot of kind of class um, labor movements at this time. And it's interesting because he actually meets his wife in one of these protests, I think they're, I forgot what their protest theme, I think it's like somewhere in South Central. And, you know, Los Angeles was very much so a very polyglot, a very multi-racial um, type of community. You have all these different groups li living there. And he marries a Jewish, um, you know, her parents are Russian Jewish people, right? And, and, and this is kind of like the interesting part about this generation is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, right? For many of these communities, their their barrios and their you know little Italy's and so forth are their home, but this generation begins to venture out and they get to be exposed to these different communities, and um, they intermarry, right? He intermarries um, or he marries a Jewish, basically a um, you know another hyphenated um, person from this generation. So we see a lot of a lot of mixing, which is exciting, you know. Again, because they saw class as a bigger struggle, not race. In the Chicano movement, race becomes more important where you kind of want to stick with your own, right? African-Americans stick with African-Americans. Chicanos have their own movement. There's coalition, uh, coalitions there, but for the most part, you know, you stick to, to the raza and so forth. So anyways, he joins these, um, he helps organize workers at, at these different unions. And he becomes very important. He tried to start a... a um, a student movement at, AS, at USC called the Mexican American Movement. And what happens is that there's no Mexicans at the school. I think he's like one of the only ones. The only other Latinos there tend to come from different parts of the, of the, um, of the world, from Latin America, and they come from money. So these concerns that he brings up, uh, they can't relate to because they're all rich. You know, if you're coming to school from Chile, you know, I don't think money's, you know, much of a problem for you, right? So um, the, the movement never really takes off. You know, there's only a few participants. But uh, once he finishes colleges, uh, or once he leaves college and 
becomes a community organizer. He forms El Congreso Nacional del Pueblo de Habla Española, which again, very different from LULAC, right? League of, uh, League of United Latin American, whatever, and versus El Congreso. This one's in Spanish. This one is formed like in the 1940s, and you see them kind of taking pride in who they are. And they have very kind of important activists in this organization. One of them is Luisa Moreno, who is the president of this organization. A lot of these time, a lot, a lot, a lot of these people, sorry, are influenced by um, kind of communist ideology, where in communism everybody's equal, right? There's no gender privilege here. Um, so you see women taking top positions in these type of organizations. So she becomes the, the president and um, later on in life, once she stops, she gets accused of being um, a communist during the 1950s. Now she's actually Guatemalan and they, they use certain laws to deport people that they see as a threat. So all she's trying to do is, you know, fight for civil rights through this organization and, you know, the United States sees her as a threat and they kick her out. Uh, my dissertation, Francisca Flores, who is a U.S. born, but she's a communist, I mean, the FBI followed her everywhere and, and you know, try to arrest her. Um, they were so afraid of her that they actually consider her one of the most dangerous people during World War II. Not Luisa Moreno, but the person, um, Francis, Francisca Flores. Uh, another woman is Josefina Fierro de Bright. And again, this is very interesting because uh, I think she's a secretary to El Congreso. A woman, um, she's a little bit more reserved, Luisa Moreno. Josefina Fierro is not. She's um, part of the kind of Hollywood crowd. Her husband was a screenwriter. I think it was part of the people that got blacklisted. And uh, again, very kind of progressive politics. And, um, you know, she stepped down to, to no one. You know, she was a, a, a force to be reckoned with. And um, she, um, again, very, very kind of active person in Mexican-American politics. So it's not just women, but it's, uh, sorry, it's not just men, but it's also women. And uh, again, showcasing her, this idea that they saw class as a bigger struggle, that they're willing to intermarry into different groups because, you know, they're all in the same boat, right? White guys poor, black guys poor, Mexicans poor. Why don't we come together and address these issues as a, as a collective? We might have more, more power that way. So what do we learn in this lecture? This generation definitely it's becoming Americanized through this kind of acculturation process, right? Um, LULAC is a little bit more conservative and they're, they, um, you know, kind of want to buy into the concept of the American dream. But again, they're still fighting for Mexican-American rights through different political means, through you know, obviously the court system. And then you have these other people such as Burke Corona and Luisa Moreno and so forth that, you know, are, are beginning to take pride in their, it's not like they're, they're, these people in particular are not ashamed of their background, but um, you know we see the name of their organizations, right? Going back to Mexican American and and El Congreso and so forth, right? Um, this generation also sees itself as U.S. born, right? Um, unlike their parents who still have these kind of ties to Mexico, this generation they got nothing in Mexico. Yeah, they might have family, maybe they'll visit once in a while but everything that is on this side of the border, they are U.S. citizens. And then lastly, I try to present, again, two different political perspectives on fighting for social justice. You have that conservative model with LULAC, but then you also have a little bit more radical with uh, people like Bert Corona and Emma Denayuka. And, and there's more in there. It's just that we just don't have the time to address all of them. I, I believe the book probably gives you more examples of women in the 1940s particularly through the, through the organization called Ucapawa. It's a long name. It's a cannery union of Mexican-American women fighting for better wages and better working conditions through these unions. So, um, we again, we don't want to show Mexicans as just victims, but they're very politically active during this era.